Our president typically asks me when I introduce him, don't say anything, just say, here's the president. But I want to tell you a little bit about him, uh, if you will. Dr. Bailey assumed the seminary's presidency after years of service as both professor and the vice president for academic affairs, as well as various roles as pastor in a local church here in the Metroplex. He was a seminar instructor for Walk Through the Bible Ministries for 20 years, is in demand for Bible conference uh, uh, ministries and other preaching engagements. He, his overseas ministries have included Venezuela, Argentina, Hungary, and China. He's also a regular tour leader in the lands of the Bible, including Israel, Jordan, Egypt, Turkey, Greece, and Rome. His, his board service includes Insight for Living, Jews for Jesus, Bible Study Fellowship, and Walk Through the Bible Ministries. We love this man. God has raised him up for such a time as this to be our leader, and we esteem him highly. Will you welcome our president, Dr. Bailey? Bill and I came to the seminary the same year. <clears throat> so he's finishing 30 years and I'm finishing 30 years. He was just a little older when he came. And so he gets to leave a little earlier than I do. But Bill and Shirley, we love you and we thank you uh, so much. And uh, this won't be the last time he's at Dallas Seminary and in chapel. Uh, it's the last time we pay him, uh, but it's uh, uh, not the last time that he will be here for sure. It's a privilege. I was introduced as the coach for the GPA. That's just one day's duties. That's today is my privilege to be with our Global Proclamation Academy. Uh, we've had other presidents of other schools, uh, other of our own faculty uh, as coaches throughout these three weeks. And it's a privilege to have these uh, men on campus uh, representing their countries, one from each of these countries. And this is our, I believe, our 11th year in doing uh, this uh, ministry. We are sort of the supporting partner uh, with REACH uh, organization, uh, which is led by our uh, faculty member, uh, Ramesh Richard. And uh, so uh, they are the, the primary leader of that, and we're, we sort of play second fiddle and harmonize with that. And it's been a joint venture for these 11 years, and it's been an incredible privilege. Uh, for those of you who are here for Super Week, we welcome you. I had the privilege of teaching in the Super Week last week. And so uh, it's great to welcome those of you who are new uh, this week. And uh, the rest of you who are resident students, uh, we really like you too. And uh, we really are glad that you're here. And it's a privilege uh, for uh, us to have you. As popularized in his book called Halftime, that came out a number of years ago, Bob Buford argues a good case for the difference between success and significance. Success is being socially prosperous in the eyes of the world, while success, or significance, excuse me, is being strategically purposeful in the eyes of God. In the opening paragraph of Paul's letter to the Philippians, Paul prays a very short prayer that if, if answered, leads to a life of great significance. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to that little book. It's a great little book because uh, it doesn't really address any sin, so it's really easy to live in for a little while. Uh, it's an encouraging book. But in the opening prayer that follows his great thanksgiving for what God began to do in them, which includes not only their tangible gift, but also their fellowship in the gospel, and it will last until what he calls and introduces a, a term that only Paul uses in this book called the Day of Christ. It's called the day of Jesus Christ, and then twice uh, in this passage and in the next chapter, it's called the day of Christ. And so Paul really has the journey from uh, what God began in them to what God will ultimately complete in them. And so you and I are, if I can say it this way, you and I are on a way, on the way to that day. And we're living life in the meantime, from the time God out of his grace captured our hearts to the time when we'll stand face to face with Christ. That's called the day of Christ. Uh, it, it was a, a day of, uh, uh, of being, uh, if I can say, commencing with Christ. It's a day that will consummate with Christ. And what uh, God wants to have happen is to continue in Christ uh, in this journey. And so with that journey motif, 
He, he's thanked God for what God has done in them. But then for our time this morning, I just want to pause and, and see three heartbeats for Paul's prayer for them as he anticipates sort of moving them toward that day. First in Philippians 1.9, uh, Paul prays for an acceleration of love, for an acceleration of love. He says, it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with all knowledge or with knowledge and all discernment. This passage, by the way, grammatically is probably one of the most complicated in Paul's uh, writings. He, he, he prays and it has a, a henna clause, a purpose clause. It has a, a ace plus an infinitive, and then it has a, a perfect participle. Uh, and it really uh, is a, a grammatically ingenious way of saying, let, let me tell you the heartbeat that I have for you. He, he, he prays, number one, that their love would accelerate. He uses the terms of abound. And then he, uh, and he adds to it the adjectives of more or the adverbs of more and more. And so it's, it's stacking up the love, so to speak, and he, he wants to accelerate love in their lives. But it's not just the pitter-patter of love. It, it, is, it is a love that's informed by knowledge, and it's a love that is demonstrated in discernment. He says, I pray that uh, your love may abound more and more with knowledge and with all discernment. It's an experience of the truth based upon the revelation of God, but it's a love that discriminates, rightly so. It is a love that acts the proper way. It's a love that expresses itself in a godly way. And so he prays that they would have an accelerated love in all knowledge and discernment. The second thing for which Paul prays is for the approval is what is best. I love this passage. He says, so that you may approve what is excellent, verse 10, and so be pure and blameless, and there's that expression again, for the day of Christ. That which God has begun in them, he wants to continue and he'll perfect it in the day of Jesus Christ. That's up in verse 5 and 6. But here, that you would be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. I want you to see three critical terms in this verse. One is the term excellence. It's really a participial construction, the things that are excellent. It's a very graphic term. Let me explain it if I can. It, 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 it uh, means to carry something, that the root idea means to carry something through a place or a structure to a different location, to carry something through. Uh, another definition of it is to cause to move from one locality to another, as the lexicon says, to carry it hither and yon, <laughs> from, from hither to yon. It, it's a movement word, uh, to be unlike. In other words, to have something over here that's different than what's over here. It's to differ as to the advantage to be worth more than, to be worth superior to as a result. Now here's what he's saying. There's a lot of bad stuff that you obviously don't want to be involved with. There's a lot of good stuff that you could be involved with. The question is, are you going for the best stuff that God wants you to choose? What's God's best for your life? That you, Paul says, I'm praying, and I'm constantly praying, that you will pick the best. The, 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 out of the things that differ, out of the things you could have, the prayer is that I could move you, he says, that I would move you from here, which is very good maybe, to over here, which is even better. And how do I know God's best? How do I know how to distinguish between the good and the better? That comes obviously from a knowledge of God. It comes from the revelation of God. It comes from the leadership of the Spirit. It comes with the model of Christ. And he says, and so be as a result of that, what's best over here is a life of purity and a life of blamelessness. Blamelessness is not sinless perfection. Nobody has that other than God. But blameless means that uh, all sin has been covered. All sin has been confessed. There's nothing that God could say, you haven't dealt with this. And uh, it is a life of purity and a life of blamelessness old story in my life that came to mind as I looked at this passage in preparation is uh, <clears throat> when I was uh, 13, we moved from Colorado to Arizona. 
from the mountains to the desert. Uh, we did that for my mother's health and my brother's education. He, had a, he was a special needs older brother and we needed his education in a special way. And so we all uh, packed our bags and moved from uh, the, the mountains of Colorado to the desert of Phoenix. <clears throat> it was the first Easter we were in Phoenix and uh, we came from the hill country of Colorado where we dressed up okay, but in Phoenix on Easter you dressed up a little bit more back in those days. And so my, my dad took me to a house that was recommended to him by one of the deacons of the church where you could buy uh, off-brand suits that had been rejected uh, out of department stores. They were still good suits, but uh, as an eighth grader, you know, I wasn't too sure I wanted to be in a suit, number one, but if I was going to be in a suit, uh, I guess I have to go with it. And so dad took my older brother and me, and we went to a house in, in East Phoenix. I still remember. I can drive by it if I go there. I know exactly where it was on 16th Street. And, uh, and, and we went to this guy, and, and, he, and he walked into this house, and it was just racks and racks of suits that had been from Las Vegas and Los Angeles and uh, you know, basically secondhand, but nobody else had worn them, but we just didn't sell them, so they shipped them. And we're looking and we're in this house and the light's not too good and I'll never forget what the owner of the house said. He says, take it outside and hold it up to the sun so you could see the color and to see if there's any frays in it. So my dad took our suits out and held it up. He didn't know what he was doing either. And uh, <laughs> we didn't know what we were doing. And so, but uh, it, it, the word that's used for purity here literally means to be judged by the sun. It comes from the word sun and judge. And uh, it, it means to hold up to the sunlight for inspection. And could I change the spelling of sun from S-U-N to S-O-N? And could I hold it up and have it sun inspected and it still be without flaws? He said, I pray that you would choose the best so that over here, life becomes sun-tested and sun-approved. And therefore, being without fault, not because of being sinless, but not having sin that's still offensive, so you would be undamaged and without blame. Why? Because one day you're going to stand before Christ. And part of the work of Christ in our lives is to lead us from then till then and to move us in that process. So he prays that their love would be accelerated. Uh, accelerated. He prays that they would approve what is excellent. And thirdly, and finally, for an abundance of fruit. Paul always had that day on his mind. And here he finishes and he says this, being filled as a result of all this, being filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. I, I counted seven times in these opening 11 verses, Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus is used. That's going to fit Paul's theme in 121, for to me to live is Christ. I mean, that's the definition of life for Paul. It's Christ. So being filled with the fruit of righteousness is having Christian character and moral qualities that glorify God. Notice it comes through Christ, and it is to the glory and praise of God. It's through the power of Christ to the praise of God. An abundance of fruit. He's praying that Christ would mature them in the harvest of moral excellence and righteousness that would glorify God because of what Christ has produced in their lives. Luciano Pavarotti, the high tenor, tells the story, when I was a boy, my father, a baker, introduced me to the wonders of song, Pavarotti writes. He urged me to work very hard to develop my voice. Uh, Arrigo Pola, the professional tenor in my hometown of Modena, Italy, took me in as a pupil. Pavarotti says, I enrolled also in a teacher's college, and upon graduating, I asked my father, Shall I be a teacher or shall I be a singer? Luciano, my father replied, if you try and sit on two chairs, you'll fall between them. For life, you must choose one chair. I chose one, Pavarotti said. It took seven years of study and frustration before I made my first professional appearance. It took another seven to reach the Metropolitan Opera. And now I think, whether it's laying bricks, writing a book, or whatever we choose, Pavarotti says we should give ourselves to commitment. That's the key. Choose one chair. 
Paul would say, that one chair is Jesus. He wants their relationships to be informed by revelation. He wants their choices to build their character. And finally, he wants their faithfulness to be the root of their fruitfulness. What's the best chair? Let's pray. Father, this is a short prayer, but it could lead to a very significant life. Thanks for bringing us this far. We're on the way to that day. Would you uh, help us make the best choices in the kind of relationships, the kind of choices, and the kind of fruit that occupies our mind, our heart, and our purposes. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.